Right, um, the Devon Historic Graffiti Survey was set up in 2018 to record the graffiti in Devon's churches. Here's an example of it in Newton St. Cyrus. It was inspired by other county surveys, the first of which were organised by archaeologist Matthew Champion in Norfolk and Suffolk in around 2010. In recent years, it's become increasingly recognised that historic graffiti is a valuable resource for study and a value in its own right as part of the history of a building. By its informal nature, it tends to represent ordinary people who are often otherwise invisible in the more formal historical record. The majority of churches have at least some graffiti surviving and it's probable that all medieval churches once had a lot more of it. A good deal would have been lost during Victorian restorations when paint and plaster was stripped away, leaving the stonework bare, which is usually how we see it today. Graffiti that was scratched through the painted or plastered surface of the stone would have been quite obvious at the time. All we have now the painters gone are the indentations in the stone if they survive. These can be quite deep, like some marks in this example from Newton St. Sires, but many of the finer or shallower ones can be invisible without the aid of a raking light. This is a torch held at an oblique angle to the surface, which creates a shadow in the cut marks and makes them stand out, as in this slide. In addition to finding graffiti on stonework, which can include monuments and effigies, it's also found on wood, such as screens and benches, and on the lead of tower roofs and fonts, and occasionally on window glass. There are many different types of graffiti, but much of what we find can probably be termed as spiritual, and seems to be associated with people's attempts to keep themselves safe. This includes a huge variety of apotropaic or ritual protection marks that were used alongside what we may understand as more orthodox Christian practices, such as a spoken prayer, with seemingly no fixed boundary between the two. The sheer number of these surviving marks indicate that their use was completely normal and that whatever their function was, it was deemed to be effective. Apotropaic marks are sometimes clustered around doorways, windows or other openings into the building in an attempt to keep harmful forces out but they can be found anywhere. It seems likely that a lot of the marks date to the 16th to 18th centuries when there were particularly strong beliefs and fears about forces of evil, including witchcraft. Many such marks can also be found in older domestic and agricultural buildings, although they may have developed to have different meanings. In this talk, we'll run through the various sorts of graffiti we find. I tend to refer to the churches just by their parish name. The first thing to get straight is that before about the mid 19th century, graffiti wasn't considered to be antisocial behaviour or vandalism as it is today. Graffiti was common in houses, churches, and even on historic monuments. So we shouldn't think of early graffiti in churches as being somehow naughty and done when no one was looking. It seems to have been normal and unremarkable to write things on the walls. In fact, there is a 1609 reference to the vast number of visitors' names marked on the lead roof of St Paul's Cathedral. And this 1620 broadsheet shows a hawker selling marking stones in red or black and in the act of writing with one of them on the pillar. Names and initials are very common as graffiti, especially around doorways. So I'll just show you a few of the more interesting examples. Here we have some 18th century initials and dates on the door at Ilfracombe, IC 1777, AB 1768. On the Sedilia at Hackham, there are some fascinating deeply cut initials and 17th century dates. I don't know what they commemorate, but they look fairly official. The symbols before the 1646 date are interesting. They look like either a row of three X's or sort eye crosses, or perhaps a W and M combined, one on top of the other. Given the context alongside the other initials, it may be just someone's monogram combining an M and a W. 
but in another context, we might consider that it could be an apotropaic mark, perhaps a Marian type mark. We'll talk about those later. There's also a very nice decorative AG1603, which is nice and early. On the south doorway at Powderham, we have the dates 1579 and 1575 and the letters LGA or possibly ILGA underneath. I don't know whether they're initials. These are the earliest written dates we have from a church so far. It would be nice to know what they signify, perhaps commemorating something to do with an individual person or some sort of happening in the church or the local community. Initials and dates within a house-shaped frame have been suggested elsewhere to represent memorials. This one is from Kentersbury and has the initials NP1700. You can see the square of the building and it has like a roof on it. Ignore this, this is something earlier that's, uh, that's been done over the top of. Some inscriptions give us a bit more of a story. This one is one of two on the tower roof at Ottery St Mary that has evacuated from London 1944. In this case, the name is D. Mobs. If we have a name and a date together, there's some scope for trying to identify people in parish records, although perhaps not for these people if they went back to London. Looking at circular motifs, it's thought that most of what we refer to as compass drawn symbols probably acted as protection marks. They're very common as graffiti in churches and other buildings. The simplest are plain circles, such as these faint examples at Woodbury. Whether you can see the circles there. Another one here, I'll just highlight that. There's something else going on in the middle. We use the term compass drawn, although they would have actually been dividers but in reality, these tools were probably rare and only likely to have been owned by craftsmen who used them in their work. It's much debated as to what tools would have been available for ordinary people to make these marks, some of which are perfect, but many noticeably less so. Some compass made marks are very complex, such as these at Axmouth. You can see on the lower motif that the tool has slipped, creating an extra arc. Probably the best known compass made design is the six petaled hexafoil, often called a daisy wheel. It's an ancient symbol and its early use includes Roman headstones and altars where it presumably had some spiritual significance. Hexafoils are found in medieval formal church imagery, including frequently on fonts, such as this one at Ilfracum. And graffiti versions are sometimes found around the font itself too. Matthew Champion has identified cases in East Anglia where hexafoils have been used to represent consecration crosses, which is interesting and something to bear in mind, although it may be fairly rare. There are some nice examples of graffiti hexafoils in the roof space at Ottery St Mary. There's a big one here, small one down there. and one in the ringing chamber, I'm sorry, no, and this is, um, this is one combined with concentric circles in a stairway at Ottery as well. There's one in the ringing chamber doorway at Clis St Lawrence. All these are in the more hidden areas of the church. While in full public view on the south doorway at Sidbury, there are several which have additional curves at the edge whether you can see these additional pieces. And in the nave of the same church is a very big one of the same design. You can just see it here, it's very faint. There's one of the leaves, there it is highlighted. It's quite possible that this one was part of a formal decorative scheme rather than graffiti particularly because there are other large official looking designs elsewhere in the church.
More unusually, at Venottery, there's a hexafoil outside at the west end of the north wall in a prominent position as you approach the church. Only some of the leaves are visible, the rest have presumably weathered away. On the same church, there's an irregular one on the jam of the south doorway, where the leaf on the left doesn't form a point. And another that may have been drawn freehand at the cathedral. You can see that the circle is quite imperfect, really. And someone's had trouble quite knowing where they're meant to be going with the leaves. Clearly these irregular ones are being done by ordinary people and with makeshift tools. It's surprising how tiny some hexafoils are, such as these on a pier at Colleton, about one and a half centimetres across. There's a lot of early graffiti in this church and these are potentially early too. But there are other tiny ones on a 19th century bench at Kenton. These could just be the result of idle doodling, the benches at the back of the church, but we don't know for sure. Beliefs in various folk practices carried on into the 20th century, so we're not dismissing anything at the moment. At Kentisbury, there's a multiple circle design, still partly covered with lime wash, outside the south doorway, so in full public view. You can see part of it here, there's a line wash over the top of it. A bit more there and a bit more there. That's what you're actually looking at. We've traced over the top of the um, what's left. And there's a similar design at Ottery St Mary, although this time it's hidden away on the wall of the Lady Chapel stair. You can see the circle is here. And there it is drawn over. Also at Ottery, there are some impressive large concentric circles in a tower stair doorway, which seems very likely a Potropaic given the location. Towers and other stairways can be a rich source of graffiti, partly because they haven't been scoured like the more public areas of the church, but they may also have been considered to be vulnerable. They were dark and in the case of towers had many vulnerable doors and window openings. On the font at Thorverton, there are concentric circles on two panels, which are completely invisible until you shine a torch across them. It's not unusual to find apotropaic marks on fonts, presumably in an effort to protect the child. You can see that on the second panel, there are also deliberate score marks across the circle design. It's possible that someone was trying to negate it, perhaps if it was deemed to be superstitious, but it's also possible that someone was rather reinforcing or adding to an existing sentiment. It's not that unusual to find a Potropaic graffiti that looks as if it's been added to or repeatedly worked, perhaps in reinforcement. The five-pointed star or pentangle was a Christian symbol in the Middle Ages with strong protective qualities, although it later became associated with magic and witchcraft. This one is on the tower arch at Coombe Martin. It is possible that this is actually just a mason's mark, but I'm not sure. There's another carved into the south doorway at Powderham. There it is highlighted along with an inverted V at the top. And there are tiny ones scored into the figures on the screen at Kenton. You can see them here, scratched through the coloured paintwork of the screen. There they are highlighted. And there's another one.
There are other apotropaic marks scored into the screen figures too, and it seems very likely that this physical association of the mark with the saint was deliberate and important, perhaps thought of as making the function of the symbol more potent. Letters or symbols that we call Marian marks are probably the most common single graffiti mark that we find. They most often consist of a VV symbol or W, which is two Vs interlocking, an inverted W, which can be also read as an M. There are plenty of medieval formal examples of the letter M or W being associated with the Virgin Mary, including carvings and badges, which sometimes incorporate a crown or a heart as on this bench end at St Columba's, Cornwall. The association with Mary was probably lost over time, especially after the Reformation, but the forms continued to be used as protective marks in churches and other buildings, and have even been found in caves. At Musbury, there's an example of an interlocking W in a doorway. We can see the form inverted or perhaps as an M on a doorway at Withercombe Rally, whether you can see in there. And you can see that the letters are filled with lime wash, which has been scraped away or weathered away from the rest of the wall. There they are highlighted. And on its side, on a pier at Powderham, where there is also an inverted W or M on the south door and a cross below it, which appears to have been turned into the letter H. Of course, all graffiti letters, Ws and Ms are not necessarily Marian marks. So we always need to consider the context and whether it's equally or more likely just to just be somebody's initial. W is very common as an initial. With this one though, the archaic form of the W plus its location on a door and close to other known protective marks strongly suggests an apotropaic meaning. Graffiti of ships is not uncommon in Devon and they vary enormously in the level of detail. Graffiti ships were probably made for different reasons and it's possible that some represent informal versions of the votive model ships found in churches in the Middle Ages and later, perhaps being made in the hope of a safe voyage or in thanks for one. There are examples in East Anglia where graffiti ships are associated with altars or images of St Nicholas, the patron saint of those in peril on the sea, which suggests a devotional meaning. This photo shows a simple three or four masted ship on a pier at Walborough. The Topsham ship on the archway to the tower has a rather strange simple hull and with indications of a forecastle or forecastle, so presumably medieval. There it is drawn in. Oddly though, there's a downward pointing arrow where the mast should be. Arrows are not uncommon as graffiti and are thought to be apotropaic. There are a number of ships on a pier at the base of the tower at Seaton. This shows the position of four of them. It's possible there are remains of at least another one in here. Sadly, an electrical cupboard has been fitted just above the photo and a plug has been cut through the wall here, which has destroyed part of, the, of one of the ships. This is a good example of why it's worth recording historic graffiti. It can easily be damaged in the normal course of alterations to the building if its significance isn't realized. This is a detail of a couple of the ships. You see the hull, the mast, the shrouds, and again the hull, the mast, and the rigging. We haven't had a go at identifying or dating the types of vessels here yet, or considering whether they may have been done at the same time, perhaps representing a scene or record of an event, 
or done individually over the course of many years. This is one of several ships scored into the lead of the tower roof and seems to be dated 1845. The Kenton ship is the most detailed vessel we have so far, with planking, rigging, sails, flags, and even the captain on the boot deck. I'll just show you a new draft tracing of that, which makes it clearer. The style of the hull is later 1500s, but the rigging includes a mix of later elements, so the graffiti may have been done rather in the 1600s. It's also just possible that it's flying the first flag of the Union, which dates to, I think, around 1604. We found quite a few crosses to date, as you might expect in churches. They vary from tiny scratchings to more substantial affairs. Many are on the main south doorway of the church, including this one at Axmouth. a big official looking one at Hackham, and three small examples at Marwood. One, two, three, and they are highlighted. Which one can imagine perhaps being done by parishioners or visitors, maybe as a mark of devotion. There are quite a few crosses with an irregular frame around them, such as this one, on the south doorway at Gittishan. You see the cross there, it's a strangely shaped frame. There's also a hexapopel up there, maybe you just able to make that out. And there's another on the tower doorway at Sidbury. I've highlighted that one to make it clearer. In a study by Jamie Ingram of the graffiti at Chichester C Cathedral, Graffiti crosses in a circular frame have been interpreted as representing the host or Holy Communion wafer, which is interesting. I'm not sure that we have any that are, represent the same thing. There's a very nice consecration cross at Fenerton. This is the only consecration cross that we've identified so far. It would probably have originally been painted Saw tire crosses are found as graffiti in churches and domestic buildings and have often been associated with an apotropaic function. This cross is on the rude stair doorway at Malden. These on the rude screen at Torbryan could be a row of four saw tire crosses or alternatively two of another symbol that we find that looks like a V with an upturned V over the top. You can imagine that's the V and there's the upturn V. And these are thought perhaps to have um, associations with Marian, with Marian marks. Interestingly, salt eye crosses are also found as designs on cast iron fire backs and door and window latches, such as this one on the south door at Ashton Church. You could argue that it's just a traditional decoration, but it does seem feasible that it's resulted from the symbol's perceived protective qualities. Building histori historian Timothy Easton was told by a blacksmith that he understood the symbol of a saltire cross between two bars, like this one. Saltire between two bars. To represent the blocking of an entranceway. Perhaps linked to this is what's known in graffiti terms as a butterfly symbol, which seems to be a mark of protection. This mark on a stairway at Ottery St Mary looks like a butterfly symbol, although it has a tail. But we need to have another look at it when we record the church properly. Some simple marks that are made of straight lines can be mason's marks or other marks related to construction, especially if they look like they've been cut with a chisel. And this one does look quite sharp. Also at Ottery though, there are what do appear to be butterfly symbols scored into the timber stairs of the clock gallery. You see here, butterfly mark. 
there it is highlighted. And I've also drawn a ring around two taper burn marks and there's another one there. On the other end of this stair, we've got another butterfly symbol, a slightly odd angle. And I've ringed a few taper burn marks, but you can see there's a lot more there. I'm not sure if this is a big one or something else. These teardrop shaped burn marks are not uncommon in medieval and post medieval buildings. It was once thought that they were accidental to candle burns, but case studies and experiments in making such marks suggest that most, if not all, were deliberately created. It seems likely that they were made in the belief that they would protect the building and its occupants, either against general harms or possibly specifically against the risk of fire. So they are protection marks in the same way as some graffiti. We haven't ident identified many in churches so far, but here are some on a screen next to the choir in the cathedral. You can see there's a group of them there, 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 another one there, another two there. There's some more up there actually. And there's a close up of one. Uh, one, there's more there. You can see that they can be quite deep and experiments have shown that this requires repeated burning, scraping away the charcoal and burning again. So a very deliberate process, there's nothing accidental about that. There's something special about finding graffiti of human or other figures. This head is on a pier at King's Kurzweil. See the head, I hope it's got a hat. There's his nose, mouth, eyes. And one at Upton Pine. At Sidbury, there's a profile of a head seemingly wearing a hood was highlighted, which cuts through the pink coloured wash associated with the medieval wall painting above. So it's clearly later than that. At Walbra, we have a faint pencil drawn profile, so I've highlighted it, of a person with a tall top hat, uh, so perhaps 19th century. Now we have some strange non-human ones. At Bothwell, there's a pier that's covered in graffiti, which includes these two figures. We don't know what they represent, but they're quite similar in a way, with huge hands, but one of them is deeply cut into the stone. The body and feet are strongly emphasized, perhaps from repeated scoring. At East Dogwell, there's a figure with its hands in the air, a headdress or spiky hairdo, and legs that look like those of an animal who he is drawn in. It's possible that these depictions represent particular mythical or folklore figures. Elsewhere, graffiti figures have been found that seem to relate to medieval plays or other performers, including hobby horses. Shoe and hand or glove outlines are common finds in churches and range in date from medieval to modern. Shoes are much more common than hands. This is a selection of the ones we've found, the majority of which are on the lead of tower roofs. Occasionally, when the lead has been replaced, such outlines have been cut out and kept and are displayed in the church. You can see these ones have been cut out. The image in the middle with the red dot shows a shoe outline on the stone bench in the cathedral and its shape suggests that it is medieval. You can see it there, it's rather faint, but there's a pointed toe back round and there's the heel again. These outlines were probably made for a variety of reasons and the reasons may well have changed over time. Elsewhere, concentrations of them have been found at known pilgrim churches, and it's been suggested that there may be parallels with medieval votive images of body parts 
with the hand or foot representing the person. Many of the later ones that survive on red roofs may have simply been traditional and personal way of marking a visit, a kind of unique signature. Although we do have a few that have what may be protection marks on them, suggesting a more serious purpose. The earliest example we have with the date is this glove from Kenton Tower Roof with the name C. Bidgood and the date 1672. The crosses on the glove suggest some spiritual element to it being made. Although it has been suggested to me that the cross with the diamond shape could perhaps rather represent a faceted jewel on the glove. If so, it was a very fancy glove and one wonders who would have worn it. Scratch or mass dials are an early type of sundial found on churches, often on the south side, which gets the most sun. They are known as scratch dials because they are often crudely made and mass dials because they may have shown the times of services. They vary enormously in their designs and the time periods, sorry, they vary enormously in their designs though and the time periods they seem to have denoted and their use is not fully understood. Some churches have several of them. Sometimes dials are found in positions on churches where they could never have worked, such as on the north side or inside the building. These are usually explained as dials from an earlier phase of the building, which were kept and then put into the new church in a different position, perhaps because their function was no longer needed. This former dial is inside the south doorway of Topsham Church. There's a similar one which has been recited upside down inside the south door at Woodbury. Also at Woodbury, in the ringing chamber wall, are faint radiating lines of what look like a former mass dial. You can see the slight shadow there in the lines. And there they are drawn in. And on an outside south wall at Southley, so still in its working position, there's a small, rather irregular feature that was probably a dial, but it is rather unusual. You see it's big gnomon hole, that's the stick that would have cast the shadow to the, um, to the markers around the edge. And there's also, oops, sorry, I skipped one there. There's also a larger, more regular one. You can see the circle of dots and the gnome on hole, although there are no hour lines really visible. It's always possible that some of these things were painted. And here's another unusual one, small one at Fenerton. Mass styles can be very difficult to spot when the stone is weathered, and it's often only the surviving central gnome on hole that gives them away. This one at Top Ness isn't that obvious to the uninitiated. There's a few lines there, but it's got a nice big central gnomon hole. Some of the devices known in graffiti terms as merrills probably did function as games played with counters, but not most and certainly not those found on a vertical surface. It seems probable that they had some apotropaic meaning. There are small, three small horizontal ones on a stone porch bench at Offwell, although the third has a line extending downwards, so it looks more like a flag. And interestingly, there are tiny vertical ones, sorry, the tiny ones the same on a, on a wall, actually very near floor level. At, um, at Topsham. On the riser of a tower stair at Ottery St Mary, there is a mirror together with other features, got groups of lines here and a grid feature there. And the group together seems to suggest some sort of apotropaic significance. 
perhaps even more than if you found one of these things on their own. At Sorkham Regis, there's a 19th or 20th century example on a book rest. Perhaps just someone doodling, but it's possible that it had some meaning to the maker. Series of grooves or score marks on the outside wall of churches, like these deep ones at Ashrington, and these at Totnes, which has them all around the church, amazingly. They're often referred to as arrow sharpening marks, as it's thought that they resulted from archers sharpening their arrows before practicing at the butts or even before preparing for a battle. When found on castles, they tend to be explained as sword sharpening marks. This explanation has been disputed in recent years and now seems unlikely. Although such marks vary greatly in character, so perhaps they shouldn't all be assumed to have the same origin or meaning anyway. It does seem though to be a good argument for some, or even most of them being apotropaic, which seems to be the current thinking in graffiti research. It's quite possible that some such marks relate to the removal of stone for its perceived curative or other properties. If anyone's interested, there's a short article about the marks on the news page of our website in the February posting. Other scored cross lines and grids are found on doorways and doors, such as these in the Belfry at Clis St Lawrence. You can see the crisscross lines there. and the clock chamber doorway at Exminster. Such marks are thought to have been apotropaic, perhaps perceived as traps or barriers, and are found in churches and other buildings. Dots and holes are very common marks and can be neatly conical, presumably made by rotating the point of a knife, or much rougher, and are found arranged in neat and pattern sorry, neat patterns or seemingly randomly placed. Both types are seen on this pier at Offwell. And on the tower doorway at Clis St Lawrence. As with other scoring, it's possible that some holes are the result of the deliberate removal of the fabric for its perceived beneficial properties. On the south doorway at Malden, five, five neatly made holes are arranged in the shape of a cross. We don't know the meaning of the symbols we call ladders, but they may have been thought of as protective. Actual ladders appear in Christian imagery, reaching up to heaven, and there is the ladder associated with Christ's crucifixion. This Kenton slide shows a tiny ladder scratched into the screen image of a saint. Notice there. The power or potency of the symbol perhaps being seen as stronger because of that association. There is a ladder on a pier at Woodbury. And another on a column in the cathedral. and one with a central rail, which is the older form of ladder, visible through the lime wash on a pier at Musbury. Merchants' marks were devised by merchants and others as a form of identification, which they could use to mark their goods and property or otherwise use as a type of signature. This one from St Saviour's Dartmouth is carved into a pier and incorporates the common symbol resembling a number four, sometimes reversed, which may have originated as a cross. The R on the right, what looks like an R, could possibly refer to the maker's name. There are others on the back of the rude screen. I've highlighted this one. Again, you can see the four symbol, looks like another R here. 
and this lovely clear one on the porch at Bondley, again the Thor symbol with other marks, I'm not sure what they represent associated with it. We haven't found much in the way of animal life so far, but at Marden there are several birds or remnants of them on a pier and on doorway. This one you can see, eyes and beak, tail. This one looks a bit more like an owl. You've only got the head really and the legs left there. We do wonder because they're spread over the church a bit more, whether they were part of a painted decorative scheme. And there, there is a large fish in the south doorway at Pay Henbury. You can see it there, which is highlighted. Head facing upwards, and it looks as if it's caught on a hook. Architectural sketches and workings are rare finds of graffiti. So we're very pleased to have this one at St. Saviour's Dartmouth that illustrates the top section of a window. You can see the pointed arch there and a central rounding that it was drawn in. There is no window of this design in the church today, but it's possible that one or more once existed. Such architectural drawings are sometimes the only evidence of a feature that was taken out long ago. Now, if you're not too exhausted, we can have a look at the graffiti in Credit and Church. During a short visit to the church recently, Bill German showed me a number of graffiti hotspots. The main areas are the sedilia. These are the canopied stone seats to the right of the altar. A recessed tomb in the south choir aisle, which also I believe has also been suggested to be an Easter sepulchre, and in the same area, the effigies on the de Sully tomb. It's no coincidence that these features are all made of fairly soft stones, which are easy to scratch or score with a knife or other pointed tool. We haven't checked the rest of the building yet, but there's unlikely to be much graffiti on the harder stones of the church, such as the volcanic trap. The beer stone is more likely. There may of course have been further graffiti on plaster and paint finishes that formerly covered the stonework, but these would have been stripped off during the 19th century restorations. The graffiti on the sedilia includes four stylized human figures. These were probably first noticed by conservator Anna Holbert when she restored the sedilia in 1978, which included removing a cover of lime wash. She described the figures as amusing drawings showing men in early 17th century dress and thought they could date to Cromwell's occupation of the church, but that's just an idea really. We haven't got any firm evidence for that. I hope you can see the figure, but I've just drawn over him to make him clearer. It's interesting that the object in his left hand and something above his, his right shoulder have been partially erased it's likely that they were letters, as at least two of the other figures are flanked by letters, possibly initials. The remains of the mark above his left hand look like a particular form of a Lombardic letter A, which has a V-shaped crossbar. Intriguingly, this form of A, which is found in normal use in the medieval and post-medieval periods, was also used to represent the Virgin Mary, a so-called Marian mark, because it combines an A with an M. Such references to Mary would have been frowned upon by the authorities after the Reformation. It seems possible that it was scrubbed out for that reason, but then we don't know what the mark on the other side was, so there may have been another reason for it. A few years ago, this figure was subject to a digital enhancement technique called RTI, or Reflectance Transformance Imaging, which makes the detail more visible, as you can see on this false colour image, which shows elements of the drawing that we can't see easily in an ordinary photo. The work was carried out by Jacqueline Christmas of Exeter University, and it's a technique that's been used elsewhere on historic graffiti, 
in an effort to see marks that are otherwise invisible. Another of the figures, I'll highlight this one because it's difficult to see, has its hands above its head and is flanked by the letters TA. And the third figure, again, I'll highlight it. This seems more rudimentary than the others with just stick, stick legs and a rather small head. It looks like the arms are held in front of the waist but on the other hand, there seems to be a raised right arm, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. The objects to either side of its head are difficult to make out. I've highlighted some of the lines, but I'm not quite sure what's represented. They don't seem to represent to uh, resemble letters. When we go back to record it properly, we'll take a series of photos lit from different directions, which hopefully will help us understanding the detail. The final figure, which seems to have indications of outstretched arms, is flanked by the letters PC. The figures are not all the same style, so probably not done by the same person, although similarities suggest that they were following a theme and perhaps represented particular people, especially due to the initials. Other graffiti on the Sedilia includes an asterisk, or Merrill type mark, and a W on its side, both possibly a Potropaic, and also some nice 18th century initials and dates, WW 1775, I or JG 1777. And a lone crossed letter I or J this is an early form of J. This is fairly common in churches and is thought to be a reference to Jesus, a sort of shortened version of the IHS monogram. The graffiti on the recess tomb includes many names and initials. It's I or J A. Quite sure what that is. R G W N A S. Sorry, and uh, yeah, also um, a small pentangle which I've highlighted there. There are also some parallel horizontal lines that look a bit like music, but this needs looking at more carefully to see if we can identify any notes. On the base of the recess, there is a shoe outline. I hope you can see that down to the toe, back up to the heel. I can't make out what's marked inside it. It does look like remnants of marks there, possibly initials. The De Sully tomb effigies have been another focus for graffiti. Much of it probably names and initials of visitors, as with effigies in many churches but also substantial holes and grooves, including one over Isabel de Sully's heart. I don't know if this could have some significance if the stone was being removed because it was thought to have some sort of protective qualities. Although there is another deep hole in the lion at her feet. By the doorway to the tower stair, there's a large and well-executed capital letter N. It's too big to be a mason's mark, but it has an official look about it. The bottom serif has remnants of lime wash in it, so it's obviously been there for some time. It seems possible that it denotes N for North. It is in the North Isle, but I don't know for what purpose. I have read that there are graffiti marks, that, sorry, there, there is graffiti that marks where processions were to start or where particular clergy were to stand and it seems possible that an official mark like this could have had some such function. Perhaps, perhaps when we've had a more thorough search for graffiti, we may find others like it. In the clock room, there are various, mainly pencil graffiti, mostly names and initials, some with dates, including this one, 
I'm not sure if that's an S or a J, quick, August 1899. There's also an earlier large MR, I've highlighted next to it, but you can just see the faint score lines there. Uh, it's called into a beam. I don't know whether these initials are have another meaning. Uh, the letter forms don't look that modern. To the right of it is a smaller VT58, either 1858 or 1958, that have been made with some sort of pointed tool. Access to the tower roof isn't allowed because of the very low parapet, but I was provided with examples of what's up there, including scored into the lead roof covering this B then 23rd of May 39. I suspect it's 1839. It's interesting that the three is a back to front, which suggests perhaps uh, limited uh, literacy. And on the stonework are the letters JP, nicely done and with a chisel, so probably by a stonemason, possibly denoting an episode of building work. A number of items of historic interest are kept in the governor's room in the church. These include this wonderful piece of moulded beer stone marked with musical notation. It was found in debris associated with a medieval college of Vickers Coral during an excavation in the church car park in 1991. The stone is a bit damaged, but you can see the lines and various notes. And our final slide is a piece of lead saved from the North Isle roof, which has the inscription W. Adams, plumber, 1849, aged 21 years and seven months. The 1849 date apparently ties in with the church restoration project carried out under John Haywood. So the inscription is a nice record of a young man who worked on the church at that time. Right, that's it. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Prue. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, do feel free, anybody who wants to, to uh, join the room in real terms at this point, if you want to. Um, there was one question that came up earlier in the chat, which I'm just going to scroll back to. Um, there we go, from other Prue, um, who asked what you think the meaning of the concentric circles is. Concentric circles. I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. We don't know what a lot of these things are. I mean, there are concentric circles in religious, you know, in Christian imagery as well, as you know, us thinking that they're they're later things. So, yeah, I'm not sure, but it could have many meanings, really. The problem with a lot of this stuff is it, it, it is quite speculative. Um, it is, yeah. 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 I, I've dropped a couple of links into the chat if people want them for a couple of. Um, interviews that I've done on this subject with people that might be of interest if people want to find out any more. So one one is with um, James Wright, who is a buildings archaeologist. Um, that's, a, that's an interview on um, ritual building protection. And then um, another one on house protection specifically, which is also to do with concealed objects with Brian Hoggard, um, who is the owner of the Apotropaios website as so um covers a lot of this sort of thing um and i'd also noted i i, I didn't say any more because i wasn't sure whether you were going to say anything pro about the fact that most people have marion marks on their bodies in what sense so if you look at the palm of your hand um with your oh, fingers yeah. and thumb pointing away from you you'll find most people will find a marion mark in the, in the lines in the palm of your hand mm. okay there you go. Everybody can go away and have a, have a go at that later on. Uh, Tony Gale says the, the credit and music in the governor's room has been interpreted and recorded. And if anybody wants to hear it, he's got a copy of it. Oh, that's excellent. Um, I wonder, Prue, if um, you could just say something about what percentage of what you're recording you think is down to construction and um, official protection of buildings, if you like. Um, and what percentage is down to visitors and idleness during a service and that sort of thing? 
Um, I'm not sure what you mean quite by official protection. Um, are you trying so, to so things things like burn marks on the beams, for example. Yeah. Um, the experiments show that normally they would have had to have been done before the beam was installed. So often they would have been done as part of the construction of the building in the first place. Yeah. So therefore by the by the woodsmiths or by the masons or whoever. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, get carry on. Sorry, that's domestic buildings really that that's been I don't know whether there's any evidence in, I haven't read about evidence in church for burn marks being, um, you know, found as part of the construction. Okay. But certainly in other buildings. So it's it's fairly, fairly likely, I suppose. Um, most of the burn marks um, in churches are on doors or the backs of screens, that sort of thing. So they would yeah. have been a lot, probably a later edition. Have you have you cast on very much of, of kind of graffiti that's been left by people during services if the sermon is particularly dull, for example, do you think? Well, I mean, that's that's what people suggest for some of these things. Mm. Um, you know, some people will argue that an awful lot of it is just idle doodling, you know, but there's just too much of it. And it's found in places where, you know, it doesn't it doesn't really doesn't really work. Like that. Yeah. I mean, Certainly some of it is. I mean, a lot of initials when you find initials scored onto benches and things. Yeah, that's probably just people bored. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know there are some good examples. I, th I think I said to you as well, uh, outside of this particular meeting, the, uh, at um, Salem Chapel in East Budley, there are some great graffiti examples on the backs of the wooden benches, which are oh. like caricatures of the vicar and things like that, which yeah. were obviously done during... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I've also seen on the backs of benches some very nicely done hexafoils that I don't think were just somebody doodling, you know. Mm. So who, who goes into a church with a very fine tool to, to do that and, and very nicely placed and often in conjunction with other known apotropaic marks. There's too much of it. I, I, yeah, certain, certain stuff like, um, yeah, or initials very often. It is mm. just order or just someone wanting to make their mark. Yeah. Um, but an awful lot of it, I think, it is a poetry pack. Um, and I think the other other surveys have found that as well. There's enough of it um, to, to show that, you know, it's, it just definitely did have a, a purpose. Yeah. 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 You know, I would certainly be inclined to agree. Uh, Glenn, you had a question. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful talk and superbly illustrated. <laughs> And um, I'll never be able to go into a church now without looking for uh, all the graffiti. Um, first, a comment. Um, uh, the hexafoils that you showed us uh, so many examples of, um, it, they look so much like those old crop circles we used to see. And it just amused me that when we were looking for crop circles, we always wanted to pretend it was people from outer space. In fact, something very similar by uh, real people was being made uh, in churches. But the yeah. more seriously, with the hexafoils, uh, I can see how you make a circle with a simple compass or something like that. How do they make the oval shapes of the, of the, the six leaves? I would have thought that would have been much harder to do. No, it's, it's quite easy actually. Yeah, you, you make the circle first. Sorry, I haven't I've got a screen. I can't um, just I'm just stipulating here, but you're not seeing me. Um, and then you place the point of the compass. Say, if you're using compass, you put put that on the outside of the on the circumference and scribe across it, and that gives you one arc. And then you move around and scribe it across it again, and it, it quite simply. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining it very well, but it could, it's quite easy to, to produce a hexafoil. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tony Gale in the chat asks, I, I wonder if the ILGA at Powderham might be two sets of initials, IL or JL, and GA with a possible marriage date. Could it be cross referenced with the parish register? Uh, uh, you could try it. You could try it. Um, yeah, I don't know. They did look um, quite close together to be um, 
I mean, I'm not even sure that the eye is related. I can't decide because it's slightly smaller, it's slightly out of line with the other letters, but then, you know, that's not always um, enough to go on. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's worth, yeah. All these, yeah, all these things could be checked in, in parish records. Mm. Certainly something for, you know, anyone to do who has the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, is this project still continuing for, into the foreseeable future? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, probably beyond my lifetime. I reckon it's, it's completely open-ended, to be to be honest. We've looked at um, about 120 churches so far, but a lot of that is just sort of initial. Well, about about half of those are fully or substantially recorded, um, and the rest are just sort of initial records, really. Quite often, we can get into a church, but you can't get into the tower without making a special arrangement. So, you know, for some of them, the towers are not done. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, will, it will run for as, as long as I run it, I suppose, and hopefully when I give up, somebody else will take it on. Let's hope so. Can people send in their own um, photographs and other materials to you to have a look at as well? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'd be very happy to, to see anything, yeah. And, and the details for that are on your website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So if people uh, want to go and have a look around their local church and um, take a few photos of anything that they find, uh, it may be new to Prue and her team. It might be well known and she can tell you more about it. Um, but do submit them to the to the survey um, and help it to grow. That would be brilliant. Um, has anyone got any last questions or comments before we draw this session to a close? Nope. Good. OK, brilliant. Thank you so much, Prue. Please, everybody show your appreciation in the chat window or on the screen or by pressing a button uh, for Prue from the Devon Historical Graffiti Survey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Prue.